Well, this is a curious thing, Domestes atar, a small, mostly black beetle that feeds almost exclusively on flesh. One of nature's cleanup crew, quietly disposing of the dead and recycling nutrients. Also known as the black larder beetle, they don't look particularly interesting at first glance, but take the trouble to see as well as to look and you'll find a whole new world. These are working their way through the dried flesh of a dead rabbit and are members of a colony I've been growing for a couple of months now. They're not hard to keep and I've had a number of colonies over the years but I don't think I've ever really understood how they live their lives. This time though is going to be different because I want to dive deeper into what makes a domestic beetle tick. There's nothing unusual about domestids in terms of being a beetle. They share the same physical layout as all insects with a head, thorax and abdomen and in common with other beetles their forewings are hardened into protective wing cases. Under those wing cases, the adults have a fully functioning pair of hind wings which allows them to fly. They're about 7 to 9 millimetres long, and although appearing like a shiny and wholly black beetle at first sight, a closer look shows they are clothed in hairs, mostly grey and brown but with some golden tufts. Their life cycle follows the standard beetle operating procedure too, starting with small elongate white eggs which hatch into caterpillar like larvae. These grow through a number of instars before burrowing into a soft substrate to pupate. I use blocks of polystyrene and it doesn't take long for the adult to emerge and take off to look for a mate and something to eat. My own interest in domestic beetles originated from their ability to pick even the tiniest bones completely free of flesh leaving a still mostly articulated skeleton which is in itself a curious and beautiful thing. This song thrush met its end by flying into an office window. Suitably prepared it didn't take long for the beetles to clean the flesh off the skeleton which was then degreased and whitened before being mounted like this bantam. I've fed mine fish and reptiles as well as birds and mammals and all types of flesh goes the same way. As well as their benefit to scientists, museums and people like me interested in preparing skeletons and other natural curiosities, domestic attraction to corpses has meant they have an important place in forensic entomology to help investigators identify things like the time of death of murder victims. They aren't all good news though, as their diet sometimes results in them being an economically important pest of stored food meant for human consumption. They can also wreak havoc in the very same museums where they are so useful if they happen to escape the beetle room and get into taxidermy collections. I found out some bits about domestics over the years but want now to learn some new things about them. I'd like to know what sort of factors determine their growth and reproduction rates and how they find their food and water. I'd also like to have a really close up look at their anatomy inside and out. A deep dive then into a fascinating and often overlooked true curiosity of natural history. This is the first video in what I hope to be a series in which I'm going to share my observations. I'll tell you how to find some to start and then develop a new colony and how I prepare the skeletons they produce. We'll have brief diversions to talk about Egyptian mummies and Victorian gamekeepers gibbets and anything else that crops up on the way. So thank you for watching this video and if you think you might share my interest in these little black beauties then please join me next time.